Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Professor Jana Roschker from Ljubljana University in Slovenia, and I'm very glad and honored uh, to have the opportunity to be speaking here for you today. Uh, and I will be speaking about comparative philosophy and about uh, some analytical and hermeneutical uh, approaches uh, in studying Chinese thought, because I'm a professor of sinology uh, and I'm also specialized on research in Chinese philosophy. So we will be uh, investigating some uh, methodological uh, questions in this um, in this uh, short presentation. So um, what is actually the problem? Um, we have to begin uh, with stating that the confrontation and understanding of the so-called foreign cultures is always linked to the problem of differences in languages, tradition, history, and socialization processes. So if I investigate Chinese philosophy, it's not the same uh, as if I investigate philosophy, which is written in my language and was, uh, in which arose or was developed in uh, my country or in my culture. So uh, many Western and Western trained um, scholars are nowadays still researching the Chinese tradition through the lens of Western uh, methodologies, Western concepts and categories, which may not exist in um, Chinese philosophical tradition as such. On the other hand, they overlook numerous concepts that are typical for Chinese intellectual tradition because they don't have an equivalent term in or concept in the Western history of thought. So um, this is of course a relict of uh, the European or Western colonial past, but, um, and, um, but as we shall see, there exist many different methodologies and the difference between them are culturally conditioned. So uh, concepts and categories cannot be simply transferred from one socio-cultural uh, context to another. But in researching Chinese philosophy, this is often the case because many Western and Western trained scholars are still interpreting it through the lens of the methodological paradigms and procedures that have been developed in the framework of Western philosophy. So uh, therefore, many scholars attach great importance to the methodology of Chinese philosophy in recently. So um, the debate on the methodological dimensions uh, of classical Chinese text and their role in the context of traditional Chinese thought is in modern studies more and more successfully turning in the direction of rediscovery and use of specific traditional Chinese methodological approaches and traditional categories. There are still many controversial opinions regarding the questions of the proper method of comprehension and interpretation of classical Chinese text. And as we can see recently in the Chinese speaking um, environment, but also um, in the Western academia, there have been um, um, published many books on the topic. Uh, among them, there is also my new book, my recent book on interpreting Chinese philosophy and new methodology. And I will also in this uh, short talk, I will also um, introduce some of um, the aspects that are brought about in this uh, book of mine. So, but one of the scholars who has already decades ago, who has um, already started uh, with elaborating on these questions is the analytical Chinese analytical philosopher, uh, Feng Yaoming from Hong Kong. Um, so in his book, Chunggu Zhishu, the Fang Falun, when did the methodological problems of the Chinese philosophy, he assumes a certain grade of incommensurability 
between the methodological systems of the so-called Western and the East Asian tradition. So he asserts that this phenomenon is connected with the incommensurability of premise networks, Xinyan, Gang Luoja, Buka, Tong Yue Xing, which is based on the impossibility of um, the transformation of certain concepts from one sociocultural cultural text uh, into the other, a problem that we have just mentioned. Um, all these leads for him, of course, logically to a certain grade of impossibility of comparisons of different methodological systems. And he called, he denoted these uh, systems with the term frames of reference. So he tried to describe uh, these frames of reference within or referential frameworks with an example of different pound pens. In this example, the pens with round or those with even button represent different referential frameworks uh, or different systems or theories. The results of the frying of the same material in different pens is different in its shape, consistence, color, and taste. According to Fung, different referential frameworks can in exactly the same way lead to different descriptions and interpretations of the same objective reality. So different possibilities and limitations of the concrete functionality uh, of both types of pens express different features of different referential frames. Uh, there are specific shortages or advantages. But as we will see, actually frameworks of uh, reference are not limited to theories which arise in different traditions of thought and language. They can also develop in the same culture. So um, for instance, um, Feng Yangming also mentions the differences between uh, Newton's uh, theory and Einstein's um, system of physics, although they are written in the same language, namely English, and they also work with the same concepts. Uh, these concepts don't uh, mean the same, uh, don't have the same uh, connotations, they don't imply the same things. So uh, Thomas Kuhn uh, also has, um, uh, has worked on this pro problem and he denoted these referential frameworks with the term paradigm. And uh, he was um, working a lot upon the question um, what happens when one paradigm in a, in a society or in a uh, scientific community is, uh, is um, replaced with, with the other one? Just like, uh, for instance, the, um, Newton's theory was replaced by Einstein's. So, uh, he writes, within the new paradigm, old terms, concepts, and categories fall into new relationships. Uh, one with the other. The inevitable result is what we must call, though the term is not quite right, a misunderstanding between the two competing schools. Consider, for example, the man who called Copernicus mad because he proclaimed that the earth moved. They were not either just wrong or quite wrong. Part of what they meant by earth was a fixed position. Their earth, at least, could not move. Correspondingly, Copernicus' innovation was not simply to move the earth. Rather, it was a whole new way of regarding the problems of physics and astronomy, one that necessarily changed the meaning of both earth and motions. So philosophical theories that arise in different cultures or in different linguistic uh, environment with different intellectual histories are embedded in different, uh, necessarily embedded in different referential frameworks. 
which are, on the other hand, linked to different methodologies applied in the process of perceiving, understanding, and interpreting uh, reality. A referential framework in this uh, sense can be defined as a relational structure of concepts, categories, terms, and ideas, as well as values which are applied in the cognitive processing of the object of comprehension. It also includes paradigms and perspectives that influence and define the comprehension and evaluation of particular semantic elements within these structures, as well as the structure as a whole. We have to know that in a, a referential, in a certain referential con, um, framework, each concept, um, the referential the framework does not only define the meaning of each concept, which is embedded into this structure, into this network, but also the relations between them. So um, we can say that the main philosophical systems of modern or contemporary West and the traditional Chinese systems of thought basically belong to two different paradigms. And I will just... Um, uh, because of time limitation, I will only shortly mention three main differences between these two frameworks today, which we have to take into consideration when doing comparative uh, philosophy, because these three differences are the most representative. So uh, we have what we have here is the framework A, Western or uh, Euro-American uh, modern philosophy, and framework B, traditional Chinese philosophy. So um, the first uh, feature is that there is a difference between um, immanence, between um, immanence and transcendence in the framework A. And uh, in the framework B, it is more, uh, that, uh, that framework is more holistic. Um, and it works with the uh, concept of immanent transcendence or the so-called one world uh, view. So the sphere of immanence is the life in here and now, the life that we can experience in which we can, um, we can know the world through uh, our uh, sense organs is not uh, completely uh, separated from the transcendent realm, which uh, somehow, which um, denotes a sphere that lies beyond of what we can experience with our sense uh, organs. But the holism, uh, this holistic system does not mean that in the framework B, in the Chinese framework, um, everything is connected to everything else and nothing can be divided from, from anything uh, else. On the contrary, this holistic worldview, the B uh, framework, is meticulously structured according to binary categories like yin yang, which we all know, then ban mo, ban mo means roots and branches, uh, ti yung, Nings body and function, um, roots and branches can also refer to the relationship between general or universal and particular. T and Jung refers to, um, to an object and its applications and, and so on. And um, so, but this binarity is of course nothing specifically Chinese because uh, thinking in contrast belong to the main, to the central features of human thought, how we, uh, how we uh, cognitive process uh, the world uh, in which we live. So binarity is, um, is a paradigm that has been developed in all philosophies also in Western philosophies, but um, in modern Western philosophies, we is based, uh, the modern Western philosophy is based on dualisms on the, uh, of the Cartesian um, mode of dividing, for instance, body and mind, 
dividing uh, matter and idea and subject and object and, and so on. So in both cases, we have a binary uh, model, but the interaction between these oppositional, the two oppositional notions that define uh, this uh, model are very different because in the framework A, in the Cartesian framework, this um, dual model is, um, is defined by a mutual exclusion of both uh, anti-poles uh, poles or, or the bo of both oppositional uh, notions. So, for instance, thesis and antithesis or body and mind, in this A model, they exclude each other, which means that this opposition is at the same time also a uh, contradiction. But not every opposition is a contradiction. So, if we go back to the framework B, to binary categories, we can see that, for instance, yin and yang, they don't exclude each other, but are complementary. So this is the main difference between these two, um, these two uh, models of binarity. And there is a third feature that is also very different in the framework A and in the framework B, namely um, the framework a is rooted in static concepts and the framework of B in the in dynamic one. So in Western science, research objects are basically transformed into static, unchanging, abstract forms. They exist outside of a specific time. They have validity outside of the time. And any object must be identical with itself in order to be expressed in the laws of formal logic, because the objects of rational thinking are concepts that is things that don't change. Therefore, this kind of thinking is based on a static, defined, fixed state. And in contrast, the frame of reference, which prevailed in the classical Chinese philosophy, this is the framework B, is based on a dynamic, changeable modes of existence. And this uh, framework, this paradigm goes back to the book of changes. So um, we have therefore take into consideration if we are dealing with comparative philosophy or with Chinese philosophy from as a Western scholar, we must take into consideration their specific frameworks of reference, which is guided by these uh, characteristics. And uh, they are, of course, uh, different from the characteristic that defined the um, Western framework. So if we take into consideration um, these specific methodological features, uh, there are two main methods which have been applied in interpreting or explaining classical Chinese text. And these are the analytical and the hermeneutical method. And let's begin with the first one. The analytical method can doubtless prove itself as a very good appropriate tool for investigating Chinese theoretical writings. However, this holds true to a certain extent only, because in my view, one of the most important shortages um, in its application of the framework of Chinese philosophy is the fact that it is of, that it often neglects or does not take into consideration the entire context of the analyzed textual part. And I will illustrate this problem by different analytical interpretations of the questions concerning the relation between three crucial uh, concepts of Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu's book of uh, the way and its uh, virtue, namely Yo, which is presence in my translation, Wu, absence, and Tao as the uh, ultimate uh, principle uh, of creating um, reality. So uh, let's uh, look at the first uh, uh, first example. Hu Shi, the Chinese scholar Hu Shi, has um, uh, has stated that in Tao Te Ching, Tao is the same as absence. So uh, he illustrated this point by quoting Lao Tzu's following statement. 
the DAO produced one, one produced two, two produced three, three produced all things that exist. DAO Sheng Yi, Yi Sheng R, R Sheng San, San Sheng Wan Wu. Then he reminds us that <clears throat> in another context, Lao Tzu also writes that all things under heaven sprang from Yo presence, but Yo presence sprang from Wu absence. So, Tian Di Wan Wu, Sheng Yu You, You Sheng Yu. So he concludes that both Dao and Wu are equally the origins of all existing things, and that they are thus equal. If you want to formalize this. Um, uh, who just analyzes into a form of uh, classical uh, um, syllogism inference, then we can see that first he said the premise, uh, first premise says, Tao is uh, produced all that exists. The premise two says, Epsons, Wu also produced all that exists. So it is, of course, logical in this framework, this Tao, that Tao can be equated with Wu. But Yelling Feng, another Chinese scholar, Taiwanese scholar, has, uh, for instance, also um, has um, advocated the opposite uh, opinion, namely that Tao in Lao Tzu is Yo present. So um, he is convinced that Tao is identical with Yo. So he uh, first uh, quotes um, the same, uh, the same um, section from the 42nd chapter of Lao Tzu's Tao De Jing, and he says, the Tao produced one, one produced two, two produced three, three produced all things. Tao Sheng Yi, Yi Sheng R, R Sheng San, San Sheng Sang Wu, Wan Wu, sorry. He explains this quotation as implying that the Tao is the mother of all things. Of course, if he produced, if, if it produced all things, it is it can be denoted as the mother of all things. After that, he quotes the first part of the sentence that was previously quoted by Husha, and he says, all things under heaven sprang from presence, without quoting the second time. So he only says, Tian Xia Wan Wu Sheng Yu You. And then he also quotes another statement from the first chapter of Tao Te Ching, Yo, presence, is the mother of all things. Yo, Ming, Wan, Wu, Zhi, Mu. So he concludes that both Yo and Tao are the mother of all things, and therefore they are identical. If we look at this inference, he first says that the Tao is mother of all things. Then in the second premise, he says, presence, Yo, is the mother of all things. And this is, of course, from this we can conclude that Tao uh, is uh, can be equated to presence or yo. Yo and Tao are the same. The third example is Zhang Dai Nian, and he believes that uh, Tao is both yo and wu, presence and absence. And he quotes um, the first chapter of Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching, which says, which says, in the eternal wu, absence, we can understand its deep, miraculous nature. But in the eternal yo, we can only see its outer fringe. Actually, these two aspects are the same, but they have different names. Together, we call them mystery. Where the mystery is the deepest, it is the gate of all that is subtle and wonderful. So he explains this by stating that Yo or presence and Wu, the absence, are both mystery. And the deepest mystery is, according to Lao Tzu, Dao. Therefore, Tao is identical with absence, but also with presence, with both Yo and Wu. So if we look at this formalized syllogism, we can see that in the first, um, he says Yo, uh, Yo and Wu, presence and absence are mystery. Uh, secondly, mystery is the same as Tao, and then conclusion, Yo and Wu are Tao. Presence and absence can be both equated to Tao. Uh, so in fact, we can use these methods to prove anything, no matter which view we advocate or um, no matter uh, on which assumptions or premises or conclusions are based, it is rather easy to find evidence for them in some of the text fragments. Such methods deal with parts of the text and analyze them 
is isolated meanings, they do not take into consideration the entire context, or in other words, they neglect the importance of the contextualization of the meaning. But this is a bad example of using the analytical method. It, we can also, of course, apply it in a much uh, better way. But yeah, let's take a look now to the hermeneutical method. This method is, um, is um, based uh, upon uh, Gadamer's fusion of uh, Gadamer's concept of the fusion of horizons and the hermeneutical circle. So these two uh, notions, let's um, the fusion of horizons refers to the fusion of what the writer or artist uh, wanted to express and the understanding of this intended meaning by the reader or audience. So each of them has a horizon, which is a certain uh, meaning. And uh, these two uh, horizons have to come together. The concept of the uh, hermeneutical circle refers to the idea that one understanding that one's understanding of the text uh, as a whole is established by a reference to the individual parts and one's understanding of each individual part by referen reference to the whole. Neither the whole text nor any individual part can be understood without reference to one another and hence they um, they uh, are a kind of circle. But this, this circular character of interpretation um, stresses that the meaning of a text must be found in its context. But in my view, this contextualization can be divided into external and internal contextualization. The former refers to the cultural, historical, and literary context of the text, and the latter to its conceptual dimensions. So recent sinological research still did not manage to develop a method of unifying these two kinds of contextualization. So the hermeneutical method is still lacking, in my view, um, inherent consistency. But this is not the only problem linked to this method. Um, because obviously this is still a very conceptual view of hermeneutic understanding on the basis of Lacan's insistence on the supposition according to which this circle is without a semantic support since the meaning is a product of an infinite sliding of the referential surface, Zizek rejects the hermeneutical circle, which implies the anteriority um, of the entirety of the semantic horizon, in particular statements. In his view, hermeneutics proceeds to the edge of the interpretation, but just before reaching it, it covers its eyes for the realization of the fact that there is no original meaning. There is no original meaning, which could provide basis for a differential network for the transmission of the reference, because the meaning is always relational, of course. So I do agree that meaning is always relational. So Gadamer's model of the hermeneutical circle, which is based upon a conceptual view of horizons, is indeed still problematic. But instead of mourning uh, upon uh, over this fact, we should rather search for an unconceptual foundation of the semantic fusion in the process of interpretation. So in my view, um, Gadamer's paradigm of horizons, which is um, conceptual in essence, as we have seen, should be replaced through, uh, by an unconceptual paradigm. And such a paradigm we can find in the Chinese tradition, and it is called Jingjie, a sphere, atmosphere, an aesthetic realm. Um, so we could try to replace the notion of the fusion of horizons, because these horizons are still conceptual, with the term fusion of Jingjie's or aesthetic realms. So the Jingjie sphere can only be experienced, but not fully described in concrete language or imagined in purely conceptual thought. In the beginning, 
Jingjie was pertaining to geopolitical discourses and hence uh, this notion of a sphere or a realm. But um, the notion of aesthetic realm primarily pertained to the objective features of external reality. The internalization of the psychologically transmitted formations of this basic level of Jingjie is linked to the Buddhist interpretation of its nature. But what is here um, most important is the fact that Jingjie represents a unification of external and internal elements. And it takes place on the level of transforming these outward formations and images into a specific mental realm, into a specific mental state, or not state because the whole thing is dynamic, but um, it is a fusion of external and internal aspects of a, which which are um, in the uh, which are very uh, important in this. Um, process of perceiving reality. So I will try, um, for, for instance, Van Gogh says, if a poem captures in words as a real scene, uh, a real scene or a real emotion, it can be said, said to convey an aesthetic realm. He also says, the realm does not only refer to a landscape or scene, the emotions of joy and sorrow, anger and pleasure also constitute a sort of aesthetic realm in the human heart. So I will try to um, illustrate this method by Zhuangzi. First, uh, let's take a look um, upon Zhuangzi's story of the seabird. It goes that there was a, a seabird which landed uh, in the in the outskirts of the state of Lu. And then the emperor of this state was very happy and he put it into the highest temple and he gave um, to the bird the most exquisite uh, food and meat and wine. And he played for it the, the best music uh, he could uh, find in, the, in his uh, kingdom. But the seabird just wouldn't drink or eat anything. It, it, it became more and more uh, depressed and after three days it uh, died. So um, Zhuangzi says that um, actually uh, the mistake that, um, that Zhuangzi, that the emperor made in this fact is that he didn't see that that which is not a bird cannot simply judge on its own and conclude that what is best for them is best for, best for birds. This is a Taoist critique of the Confucian golden rule, at, um, which says that we must be, um, that, uh, that everybody should treat other people as uh, he or she would like to be treated by others. But, um, we must be aware of the fact that we are parts of different wor worlds. This is also a core message that Zhuangzi wanted to impart through this story. But uh, naturally, this is not uh, merely an assumption of Zhuangzi's method of perception and communication. Um, it is not by any stretch a system of logical systematization. So if we... Um, can uh, try to formalize the main message of this story, uh, we can say uh, the first premise says human beings can not know birds. The second premise says I am a human being. So the conclusion is I can not know birds. So if this applies, then it could also apply with the same thing with fishes. First, human beings cannot know fish. I am a human being. And conclusion, therefore, I can not know fish. So, but according to Zhuangzi, this is not so. Uh, this is not so simple, because um, the following is only uh, my subjective uh, interpretation of the 
to stories, but let's uh, let's um, look at the story. So Zhuangzi and Huishu are strolling on a bridge over the Hao River, and Zhuangzi says how easily the white fish swim swims to and fro. This is the joy of fish. And then Huishu says, but you are not fish. So where can you know that it is the joy of fish? Zhuangzi then says, but you are not me. So how can you know that I do not know? What is the joy of fish? And Huisha says, I am not you, therefore I cannot understand you. But you are also not fish, and therefore you cannot understand fish. That's all. Zhuangzi says, well, then let's go back to the beginning. You asked me, where can you know what is the joy of fish? So at the time you asked me that, you must have known that I knew what is the joy of fish. Well, I knew this on the bridge over the Hao River. Of course, um, um, the real um, reason for my adding more water to this flow of many, many different interpretations that are going on of this story is because I would like to show you uh, why, uh, how this uh, fusion of jingjies uh, should, um, should um, function. So um, if we try, uh, well, the interpretation of Zhuangzi is not only um, um, play with words, although um, they use in the Chinese text, they use the interrogative an, which can be interpreted as how or whence or where. So if we understand the, this interrogative an, in the sense of where, then Zhuangzi's last uh, reply was, of course, completely coherent, uh, because if Huishu asks him, where, whence can you know uh, the joy of fish? And he says, well, I knew this on the bridge over the Hao River, then of course this uh, answer, this reply is completely okay and, um, and valid. But uh, if we try to connect and understand both stories in the, this way, namely considering the broader essential context of which they are both part, the, the seabird and the Zhuangzi, we can easily see that they are both dealing with relationships. They are linked to intersubjectivity, the bird and the emperor and uh, Zhuangzi and Huishu and the fish. The first essay, the bird, about the um, bird, emphasized differences between different beings. If one desires the well being of everything that exists, one must, according to Zhuangzi, first get used to the fact that we are all different. But only on the basis of knowing this fact, namely the fact that we all live in different worlds, can one create close mutual contacts. So the creation of such contacts and communications in turn proves again that we all live in a single unified world as the second story shows. Zhuangzi's comprehension of the joyfulness of fishes uh, resulted from the entire context in which the fishes were observed. Zhuangzi was joyfully strolling in the friendly nature, accompanied by his best friend, and he enjoyed the whole situation of which the fish were also part. Hence, his joyfulness could not be separated from the fish and vice versa. It was precisely this very unification in joy, namely the fusion of this joyful Jingjies, which made his innate, complete, and comprehensive uh, understanding of fish um, possible. So I would like to demonstrate how a new meaning and understanding can be acquired through the method of unifying or fusing the aesthetic realms, Jingjies, that can be experienced in these two separated anecdotes without relying on their strictly conceptual connotation. 
So the aesthetic realms experience in both stories can show us very clearly that ultimately it is human individual subjectivity which determines what should be regarded as genuine relationship. So intersubjective understanding is not conditioned by the criteria of objective, of objectivity with agreed upon concepts, but rather by the thing itself, namely by understanding and by experiencing the aesthetic realms in which they are embedded. The dynamics of being limited to the intimate world of an individual on the one side, and the model continuous merging of all individual worlds into a single one on the other permits our existence. And finally, the fusion of their individual aesthetic realms is precisely the starting point for constructing a tiny bridge of understanding connecting Zhuangzi and his reader in here and now, or what we call time and space. But, so we can see that we have to interpret different parts of a text in a broader context. In this way, we can try to see what is beyond the conceptual uh, understanding of a certain text, and we can come closer with this um, with this method to the original meaning, or maybe not the original meaning of what the writer wanted to say, but rather to the meaning in the sense of how the text is speaking of us. Because we can quarrel, of course, for days and nights about the uh, outer um, hermeneutical context. Was Zhuangzi really the one, the author who wrote this uh, text? Uh, what did he want to say to the society uh, at, of his time? Uh, how is actually, um, to whom was he actually speaking and why? And what, what kind of message he wanted to impart uh, in his society? These are, of course, all very very important questions, but um, I think that these are questions that cannot be completely clarified anyway. So what I think is even more important is the question about how is Zhuangzi or any ancient Chinese text speaking to us? What does it want to uh, say? And they can, in this sense, this text can um, represent a kind of inspiration for our life in here and now, in our time and space. But now, speaking of time and space, I would like to um, conclude my presentation because my time is over, so thank you very much for your uh, patient listening. <laughs>